Putri Rilo uh, from GE Research. Radislav uh, had his bachelor's from Kiev Polytechnic Institute in optoelectronics and his PhD in analytical chemistry from Indiana University. He has more than 100 uh, US patents and uh, 150 publications. He has co-authored and co-edited eight books and is a senior member of IEEE and a fellow of SPIE. He's currently a principal scientist uh, for micro and optoelectronics at GE Research. So with that, Radislav, it's our pleasure to have you here. Please take it away. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you organizers for inviting me and uh, we'll switch gears a little bit. We'll talk about functional materials, soft and uh, uh, not soft and uh, functionality will be for gas sensing. So uh, I'll show you how we've been inspired by nature by looking at those three-dimensional structures of uh, brilliant morpho butterflies and how we grew up from there. So today I'll cover why gas monitoring uh, is important uh, these days, then what are the, exi the existing solutions? I'm trying to see. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, what is our approach for gas sensing? We call our sensors multivariable sensors because they have more than one output and uh, how we are uh, doing these types of measurements with the photonic structures and uh, uh, how we uh, took uh, advantage of the knowledge on how they're designed and uh, expanded on that. Okay. So for gas monitoring, there are many drivers and those drivers are different industries as you can see. And uh, also the, the trends in this slide, I'm showing that accuracy is number one unmet need for devices that are expected to be small size and low cost. And uh, overall the top three requirements for those types of devices, as you can see are high reliability and accuracy cost and power, and uh, the drivers are quite significant. You can see that the markets are billions of dollars. So as an example, everybody knows uh, air quality index and uh, uh, sometimes the color is not uh, uh, green and uh, what it is. Uh, it is the combination of uh, measured, several measured parameters, such as these four gases, ozone, CO, uh, uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide and uh, some particles. And uh, to do those measurements, I'm showing here that there are well-established analytical instruments that do the job quite well. They accurately do those measurements in order to have the accurate uh, uh, quantitation of this air quality index. Okay. And uh, also at the bottom of this slide, I'm showing that if needed, People have an SUV or a truck or a shed on the side of the road because to get such accurate measurements, you need those analytical instruments, okay? These days, of course, there is another universe and that universe is of uh, different gas sensors. So we are a part of that universe as well, as well as the first universe of analytical, uh, traditional analytical instruments. So what I'm showing here is that very often to have the sensor for different types of gases, some of those gases are uh, infrared or spectrally inactive and therefore people have their sensing material, relevant physical transducer, and then that uh, sensing material changes its property and the transducer does the measurements of those changes. So these days you can see that they're very miniaturized, they're very uh, available, not very expensive, and uh, uh, very popular for some applications. However, by design, I'm showing on this slide at the bottom, is that by design, those sensors were designed last century with one output per sensor. Why? Because uh, at those days, the industrial and residential safety was the priority for those types of devices. And uh, those reasons, the concentrations that those sensors were trying to measure, they were quite high. And you know what type of a leak to expect. And that's why those are some examples of catalytic sensors. 
then improvements with the whitestone bridges, there are semiconducting metal oxide materials, and uh, those are uh, examples of those devices with single output. Now, when those sensors are used for detection of smaller and smaller concentrations of gases that we want to detect, and uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, more and more uh, types of uh, other types of background gases that will compete for my sensor signal, then I will have less and less accuracy of sensor response. Here I'm showing examples of those four gases that uh, people are detecting for air quality index. And uh, what I'm showing you are the correlation plots. So x-axis is the response of a reference big instrument, and the y-axis is the response of a sensor. So you can see that these correlation plots don't have a very nice uh, correlations, and that becomes a discussion point what to do. And uh, I'm just showing a couple of, um, uh, I would say, um, references or um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, opinions from EPA that are saying, well, those uh, small sensors really I cannot meet the regulatory monitoring requirements, so please don't use them to make the decisions. And uh, in uh, Nature articles, you can see that the uh, confessions are also around the performance of those sensors. And uh, we, as the sensor developers, we really pay attention to these uh, opinions because these are the voices of the customer. So as in many other uh, sensing developments fields, the accuracy is big deal, and uh, for the revolution in these sensors to take off, that accuracy needs to be improved, and those correlation plots need to be much better. So that first universe that I mentioned of those uh, analytical instruments, if we look how they are designed, then we need to understand that they are designed not to be afraid of this complex chemical environments and they're designed in such a way as they have independent outputs in their response and those independent outputs they really help in uh, pushing the responses to different gases of interest and interferences into different directions and uh, unfortunately the laws of uh, physics and electronics they prevent the uh, infinite miniaturization of those devices so it's uh, difficult to uh, envision that they will be as small as the coin. So something else should be brought into the design principles in order to uh, continue the miniaturization without the sac uh, sacrificing the accuracy of the response. So our philosophy is that we take mathematics of those large instruments and we use different methodologies, philosophies, approaches, concepts for uh, hardware. And what I'm showing here is that our multivariable gas sensors, they operate at uh, different frequencies across the electromagnetic spectral range. And you can see that uh, at uh, low, relatively low frequencies, we are operating in the RF uh, spectral range. And then at uh, uh, higher and higher frequencies, we are in the optical spectral range. So uh, philosophically, we would like to be as good as those large instruments. So I will uh, be talking about our uh, um, developments in the bio-inspired sensors here. So on this slide, I'm showing that we were fascinated on how the uh, natural structures behaved uh, for gas sensing applications that we had. And then uh, we have learned what are the de design rules for the gas sensing of uh, those structures. And uh, we started to make our own structures. And uh, we uh, grew up from um, being um, uh, soft polymeric materials. And uh, for high temperature applications, we also started to do the uh, structures with the inorganic materials. So initially, we were puzzled first, uh, excited next. And uh, our community really liked our uh, results. Uh, when uh, we used the uh, iridescent butterflies and uh, uh, we uh, exposed them to different gases. Well, this is the uh, Cornell Symposium. 
So I need to say that 100 years ago, one of the professors there, uh, he did nice experiments on uh, looking at the refractive index of, um, uh, of uh, uh, these types of uh, uh, structures. So uh, he was putting the different uh, solvents and uh, he was seeing when the iridescence disappeared. Well, uh, I repeated this experiment, so that's why this picture is in, uh, in color. But uh, uh, what you can see is that this uh, iridescent comes from the scales that are 100 by 50 microns. And then if you look at the cross-section of the scales with the electron microscope, then you can see that those are the structures of um, uh, vertical ridges and horizontal lamella. And then these lamella are producing the uh, multi-layer uh, multi interference patterns. And uh, also the ridges are contributing to the diffraction effects. So when we're exposing this sensor structure to uh, vapors, the color change is dramatically smaller, and we're looking at the differential reflectance spectra. So what it means is that we take the ratio of the spectrum uh, when we are exposing it to uh, vapor, and we're normalizing it to the spectrum in clean carrier gas, such as air. When we do that, then the spectrum in air will be a flat horizontal line, and then any response will be uh, is the will be the change from that horizontal line. So the fascinating thing for us and for the community was that uh, when we were exposing these structures to different closely related vapors such as water, methanol, ethanol, then we were able to discriminate these types of volatiles quite easily. You can see the spectral changes. Uh, that were associated with the different concentrations of those gases. But when we did the multivariate analysis, such as principal components analysis, this is the scores plot, then you can see the responses to different vapors are going into different directions. And that was quite unexpected. So that was very uh, exciting for us. And uh, with the, uh, the uh, program that we have, we have learned why it is happening. So what happens is that it's known from 60s that the mm, scales, uh, these Christmas tree structures, they have the conformal epicutical layer, okay? So that thing is about five, seven nanometers thick. But what we have learned is that the chemical composition of that uh, epicutical layer has the different surface polarity uh, from the top to bottoms of, uh, of these uh, trees. And uh, that's because how the structures were formed when the butterfly was growing. So uh, this knowledge really propelled us in understanding how those sensors uh, should be operated when we will be making them uh, in, in our labs. And uh, experimentally, we saw our results, as I'm showing, here on the bottom left, uh, right of this slide. But uh, theoretically, we also show that if we have the uh, polarity gradient, then our theoretical or simulation results, they resemble our experimental results. And uh, um, um, from the computations, if we remove the polarity gradient, then our gas discrimination disappears. So it was very exciting to us to expand on that knowledge. And here we're showing the chemical functionalization of this natural morpher scales with, um, for example, this uh, fluorinated silane. And uh, uh, we can show here that uh, upon functionalization, we are enhancing the response to closely related alcohol vapors quite significantly. That was uh, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, development. Uh, we have learned uh, the design rules, I'm highlighting here that uh, we understood the need for um, chemical functionalization and the special distribution of that chemical functionalization and also the importance of uh, slight extension of, uh, um, of, uh, of this photonic nanostructure. So with this, we were able to start fabricating the different structural designs. Importantly here, I'm also showing the reflectivity spectrum of a morpho butterfly. And just to show that it has a very, uh, not very complicated spectrum. And the, the 
structures that we have been fabricating, as you can see, they have much more uh, diverse spectral features. So this is um, um, an example of uh, two fabrication methodologies using conventional lithography. Uh, we were able to make these structures with um, not only single material, but also with the different materials and uh, with the um, beam lithography, uh, you can see that uh, we are able to uh, fabricate structures with the multiple uh, lamella and uh, uh, these were from uh, PMA, P PMMA and uh, other materials as well. So when we expose them to different types of volatiles, as you can see, you see the diverse spectral responses and uh, our scores plot shows the ability to resolve those uh, volatiles quite well. The higher dimensionality of uh, this response, like 2D, 3D, 4D, the, the better the performance of, of the sensor to reject interferences and uh, uh, to do the measurements in uh, complex mixtures. Uh, because we are the part of um, sensing community and electronic knows, I'm North American chair of those, Electro, electronic uh, nose people, uh, we have these different types of sensor arrays and we really wanted to compare the performance of our individual sensor with those sensor arrays. So I'm showing that uh, we are outperforming uh, the uh, metal oxide semiconducting sensor array and quartz crystal microbalance sensor array in doing the uh, mixtures of uh, uh, different components and uh, that's because of the nature of our uh, sensing structure. We graduated from uh, uh, doing the measurements only with the polymeric materials and for high temperature applications such as uh, for detection of uh, uh, gases for solid oxide fuel cells, we are also developing the uh, structures based on inorganic materials and also on materials with uh, uh, different functionality. On this slide, I'm showing that we are functionalizing our materials with uh, either nanoparticles of different size. This is an example of uh, gold nanoparticles, or we are functionalizing the structures with the uh, nanoparticles of different metals. You can see gold, platinum, palladium. And at the bottom also, I'm showing an example of uh, other structure design. So. With uh, these types of uh, sensors, we are able to detect those relevant gases to uh, solid oxide fuel cells. For those applications, the concentrations should be quite high per sense levels. And here I'm showing the differential reflectance spectra for these types of uh, gases at uh, several concentrations. And uh, uh, because of these diverse features, we are able to discriminate and quantify those two gases quite well as an example and also I'm showing that at different wavelengths of that spectral feature. You can see the diversity in dynamic response as well. And uh, that uh, is pronounced either fast response to hydrogen and uh, no response to CO. And uh, you can see some examples uh, here as well. So uh, we use portions of the data set for training, the other portions for validation. You can see the correlation plots and uh, uh, the responses like that. Uh, to come to finish this presentation, so I would say we industrial researchers and uh, our goal is to uh, bring the innovative technical solutions to our customers uh, that um, are uh, uh, allowing them to deliver new uh, types of assets to, um, to the end users. And uh, we're working closely with the uh, uh, G businesses and uh, external partners. And very often the partners are asking, well, you say your, your sensors are very nice and uh, well, show us that your, your sensors outperform some other ones that I can buy on internet, okay? So, so that's why uh, we work with our customers and we show that, well, we have a, a scientific community who uh, likes our um, approaches and uh, um, I'm showing that we are, are working with different uh, um, um, governmental agencies on that and uh, importantly uh, we take these innovations and uh, bring them to uh, commercial applications as I'm showing on this slide 
and uh, that's uh, uh, basically a uh, very important aspect of uh, uh, our uh, research at uh, GE Research Center. So um, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, collaborators on uh, these bioinspired photonic structures, and uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Radislav, for the great talk showing functionality that's bio-inspired by from flexible structure. So uh, I had a question. So yeah. as a, your bio inspiration is comes from flexible structures, and these uh, you are creating these thin uh, structures that could be flexible. Do you envision integration of these uh, structures in the flexible sensors, or is there a need for that? Yeah, the reason that I'm smiling because if my structure is one by one millimeter, then we will decide we will decide if we want to be flexible or not. If the structure is as big as the butterfly, such as 10 by 10 or 20 by 20 millimeters, right? Then uh, it can be more advantages to have it flexible. Uh, so the short answer is that we're interested in uh, flexible structures for smart skin and other applications. So that's why uh, I would say, uh, depending on the design requirements, uh, they can be flexible, yes. And very much right. uh, material yep. choices can be uh, related to such requirements. And uh, so that's a very interesting direction, yes. Thank you very much. So before we take a break, uh, Michelle, has to make an announcement and then we'll take a 10 minute break and be back at 10.55, uh, yeah, 10.55. Yeah, the only thing I want to ask, uh, I hope you are hearing me well, is uh, for speakers and co-hosts, so CCMR staff who are co-hosts, to keep the Zoom running. It's simply easier for us instead of you know, recreating you as co-hosts. So please mute, uh, you know, turn off your video, but remain for again, co-hosts and speakers. Uh, and CCMR staff were, you know, co-host uh, already. So we don't have to repeat, you know, the process again. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We will be back and resume in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 